I'm Kathleen Ann Goonan, and I'm going to read from this shared dream, which is my seventh novel. It's out from Tor. Uh, beautiful blurb from Ursula Le Guin and Connie Willis and Jack McDevitt and Eileen Gunn. And it's a very good novel. I'm going to read a chapter that is not at the beginning, but it's about three chapters back from the beginning. Let me bring you a little bit up to date. Uh, in, the, in chapter one, Jill, who is really one of the main characters, uh, has had, this chapter is called The Crack Up. And she has uh, actually been involved in changing time streams. And uh, there is a lot more to that. And I'm going to start with her sister's reaction. This is Megan. Megan gets riled. March 21st, Northern Virginia suburbs. Megan thoroughly enjoyed riding the Metro. She loved surrendering to motion, motion without attention. It gave her two extra hours a day to read. She read with great enjoyment things that few people enjoyed reading, scientific papers. Her field was memory research. Unlike her sister Jill, who had taken years to finally buckle down and finish her doctorate, Megan had gotten on the fast track while still in high school. Why memory? Because that was all there was. Everything you think is happening now already happened. You're processing something that happened a few seconds ago. Our reactions are slow. We live among wavelengths. We are wavelengths. Wavelength is all there is. All right. I know I just said that memory is all there is, but now we're getting down to the physics of it. All the bits and parts of us, the fabulous multiplicity of us, is what I want to know about. Try using those lines at a cocktail party. She usually just said, I'm in research. When pressed, she said, scientific. Thoughts flowed randomly when she found stimulating as the metro car glided next to, over, and below traffic. She liked the physics of sound, the change in pressure as they went into a tunnel. She liked how quiet everyone was. She liked to look at the clothes people were wearing and think about their lives. The woman sitting across from her, reading the latest literary bestseller, carried a canvas bag that proclaimed WETA. Black high heels were crammed on the top of the bag. She had exchanged them for purple running shoes because walking, and sometimes running, were a part of using public transportation. Megan was fortunate her job did not require much dressing up. She usually kept her cue phone, most people just called them phones, off while she was on the metro. It was her thinking time. She couldn't imagine life without cue. It was affordable, always accessible brain. After JFK and Khrushchev negotiated detente, much to the dismay of hardliners everywhere who still tried to stir up trouble, much scientific information was rapidly declassified. Satellites now provided access to public information. Q, short for quantum, was a new form of communication built on ever-changing but always there particles. They flashed in and out, uh, out of existence rapidly, a form of energy capable of holding and transmitting vast amounts of information. Megan had heard rumors, generally from slightly drunk physicists at parties or out and out geeks, that an early variation of Q, a very strong consciousness changing form, was embedded in the cereal box space toys they'd all played with as children. Whenever she tried to track down more information about that esoteric conspiracy type twist, she found nothing. She'd gotten hold of Betty's war records, that's her mother. It was no secret that she had been in Europe in the Women's Army Corps, but exactly what she had been doing was not clear. The huge stack of papers from the Army was mostly black with redactions. The CIA did not admit that Betty had been an agent. Out of the bits and pieces of information that Megan had acquired privately from old letters or remembered snatches of conversation, she'd been too young to understand, she'd put together a rather surprising tale. 
Her mother, Betty Elegante Dance, and her father, Sam Dance, had helped develop Q, a more radical form of it than was now used for daily communication. Megan called it Strong Q, a form of Q that promoted neuroplasticity. Strong Q could rewire brains, accelerate learning in adults to preschool speed, and mess with the very stuff of memory. Strong Q explored and used the quantum physics basis of mind and consciousness to its own advantage, as if it had a personality, an agenda. It was really kind of frightening. So it was no wonder that this deep basis of the Q that everyone, almost everyone, knew and used and loved was not public knowledge. Megan had very little idea of how this had come about, though she had tried very hard to get to the bottom of, of it. Sure, there were standard histories of Q's development, but strange physics shrouded its depths. The physics that people had heard of, mostly related to Einstein, but about which even those who had worked on the theories disagreed. Through dogged research, Megan had found papers authored by Rutherford and Haddens, and Meitner and Haddens, except that no one seemed to know who the mysterious Dr. Haddens might be. One rumor had it that she had died in a concentration camp during World War II. Presently, the great leap in communications fostered by Q is explained by the synergistic school of thought and various esoteric mathematics, new ways of looking at phenomena. But when you got right down to it, as Megan had tried, one encountered a maze of human thought that rivaled that of early quantum physicists. In fact, it was based on those stunning early 20th century revelations by Curie, Einstein, Dirac, Born, Heisenberg, Meitner, Planck, Schrodinger, and many others. But the legend that drunk physicists shared at parties was that Q had something to do with the basis of human consciousness itself. Which brought Megan back to memory research. The questions, what is memory? What is consciousness? Seem pedestrian, even meaningless to most people, but to Megan they'd burn more brightly than magnesium. Class books using Q were embedded with an altruistic baseline able to evaluate the intent of the user. Q could not be used for injurious purposes. It made decisions drawn from a wide philosophical, biological, and moral database. It was able to discuss decisions and argue with users and was a vast consensus-based network. Q readily passed the Turing test. This pleased some, frightened some, and angered many. It delighted Megan. When questioned, Q declined to answer questions about its own development. Megan assumed that it had decided to lie for altruistic reasons. She assumed that Q was engaged in a constant hacker war in its nether reaches. Despite this, the world had accepted Q as a necessity, like electricity. Electricity could be dangerous and deadly, but tamed by engineers, it made modern life possible. If Megan tried to talk to Brian and Jill, her brother and sister, about their parents' possible role, they shrugged it off, Jill most vehemently, and Brian because, how could his little, little sister know more than him? At least that's how it seemed to Megan. But there was a lot about Brian that just plain wouldn't talk about. Like most people, at least he didn't drink all the time anymore. Megan had decided that it might be best to keep her thoughts to herself unless she could prove them beyond a doubt. And the only reason she wanted to prove them was to find her parents, if they were even findable. But why would they stay away from their family if they had a choice? That was a heartbreaking question she had to face and try to answer, if her theory was true. If they were alive, where were they? Could they at least leave a clue? What might they be afraid of? As a parent, she realized that her child and protecting her child from assault or injury was her most primal underlying concern. So, if her theory about their mother was correct, what were she, Jill, and Brian being protected from? Abby, her five-year-old, would be home with Jim by now after a day at Montessori school. Jim was a political commentator and worked at home. Megan was 36, Jim was 50. His curly black hair was graying at the temples and his beard was almost white. Of medium height and a bit too heavy, his blue eyes twinkled through old-fashioned round glasses. Once divorced, he was tickled to have another chance. 
He was astonishingly kind, adored Abby and Megan, and had the wicked sense of humor Megan was so used to in her family, although she, he usually kept it sheathed except when writing. They lived in a 40-year-old suburban neighborhood, Tall Oaks, nestled beneath a canopy of deep breathing trees. Megan might be too involved with her pursuit of information. She might appear to be completely absent-minded, sometimes even cold to her brother and sister, but she was busy. She tried to connect to people, really she did. Jill was much more outgoing. Megan preferred to sit back and observe. She transferred to a local bus, which soon trundled through her neighborhood. Every few blocks, a grandiose monstrosity hulked over the modest split levels and ranch houses that had housed a generation of post-war children. Less kempt yards here and there contrasted with smooth, glowing green lawns. The tall grass yards were often those of people who bought there when the houses were new, although one young man maintained that he had a right to have a meadow rather than a lawn. In true tall oak spirit, different than more restrictive outer suburbs, where 1984 was reality, no one had challenged that right. When she passed the tall grass home, Megan missed her parents. Halcyon House, her childhood home, was empty now. Enveloped in the wild evolution of her father's famously inclusive one-acre flower garden, and ever smaller areas of grass irregularly mowed by a succession of local kids. Megan mostly missed her dad. She had lost her mother in 1963, Mom went somewhere and never came back. It's probably why memory interested her so much. She didn't so much want to look at a photograph of her mother, mother, which were strangely few, as to feel the touch of her hand, smell her hair, hug her legs as Abby hugged hers and be drawn into her tight embrace. Take the drug that would reactivate experience. She wanted her childhood back. All that was long, long gone. New leaves shimmered in late afternoon sunlight. Kids on bikes shouted and waved to one another. The bus passed, Rath, passed Rathbone Place. Jim occasionally expressed thanks that they didn't live on such an ominously named street. Because she felt happy in small, confined places, she had removed the doors from the upper closet in her study when they had moved in and stored them in the attic until she saw the ad for authentic original Tall Oaks house parts, and those plain closet doors brought her a hundred bucks, a few pillows, a lamp, and books, all things from her parents' old house downtown, furnished her tiny loft where the closet doors had been. In fact, thought Megan, she was oddly but blessedly happy J about just everything in her life. Everything was in order, unsurprisingly. She liked it that way. The only thing not perfect right now was the state of her research. She might well lose her funding if she didn't come up with the more focused chimera that she had pursued all of these years. What is the neurobiological foundation of empathy? And can it be dependably, pharmacologically, or otherwise replicated? Memory, including the phenomenon of false memory and the ability of humans to create stories and share them was a vital part of her theory. Her colleagues took these astounding abilities for granted. Memory was not sexy. No one threw money her way, money with which to hire, set up research, and enable experiments. This did cast some darkness on her life. It seemed so damned important. The spread of true empathy disseminated via carefully thought out vectors might well unravel the world as everyone knew it. Such a change would be as momentous as the other great watersheds sheds of human history, the invention of printing, the development of science. Perhaps, Megan often thought, she was just not very good at convincing others that she was on the track of something important. At other times, she thought that maybe she was too good. Maybe she was on the track of something that many people feared, a power shift from the few to the many. Revolution, pure and simple, and all the blue sky and heartache that revolution might bring. From deep in her purse, her phone emitted a muffled beat message. Instead of going home when she got off the bus, Megan called Jim, spoke with him briefly, and headed down the service road bounding a creek that ran to a small marshy lake. This is where she always went to think. But first she rummaged deep in her bag where she kept her pack of cigarettes. Yes, she had stopped smoking when pregnant with Abby. Yes, she never smoked at home. In fact, hardly smoked at all. 
She did, though, buy a fresh pack of Chesterfields every month and gave the old, usually unopened pack to the first bum she saw when she came out of the drugstore. She ripped open the cellophane, took out a cigarette, had it match lit in record time. Clamping it between her teeth, she hoisted her bags, headed down the white gravel path, took deep, mind-sharpening drags as she moved with long strides into the, uh, into the pre-plantation revolutionary war vintage forest. Braddock's famous road was just a mile away, and she liked this living vestige of the past, wise and restful, her refuge. Two boys poked at something in the creek with sticks. Hundred-year-old oaks towered overhead. Geese honked, harsh voices rising in eternal goose argument. A bite swished past. It was hard to believe Jill was committed. Then again, Jill, her sister, let fly without odd comments that revealed she was in what could be charitably described as another reality. Megan trudged along. Her shoes got muddy. Her briefcase and purse weighed heavily on one shoulder. She turned things over in her mind as the road dwindled to a path and the smell of thawed earth grew stronger. She stored her spent cigarette butt in a little metal pillbox and lit another. Brian, their brother, was at St. Elizabeth's now and said they had Jill on lithium. Why were they using such a big hammer? In Megan's opinion, Jill's life was much too demanding. She was completing her dissertation and working at the World Bank and in her bookstore as well to pay for what Megan thought of as Elmore's folly. Elmore, Elmore was her husband. What she really needed was a vacation from her life. Elmore's insistence on his showy folly had forced Jill to leave her full-time job at the bank, the World Bank, predicated on the promise that when she finished her languishing doctorate, her pay would double. Jill's schedule had been manageable before she went back to Georgetown. The bank paid for Jill's doctoral work, but Elmore was incensed about the temporary loss of income, saying that she could go back to school, not political science, but law school, which assured her one of an income as soon as he made partner. Everything in life was supposed to be to sync with his internal schedule of how life would move ahead, presumably trailing perfect spouse and child in his wake to display when necessary. At least that's how Megan saw it. She knew that Elmore and Jill had ferocious arguments about whether or not to sell the bookstore property, which had appreciated tremendously in value to pay for the folly, either that or transfer the, form the store into living space. Jill would not let go of her store, even though, as Elmore often pointed out at family gatherings, it didn't do a whole lot more than break even and took up a lot of their time. A new home was certainly a fine townhouse on one of the best streets in Georgetown. Although, to twist the knife, Elmore often mentioned that the bookstore, with its commanding view of Key Bridge and Rosalind, would have been the perfect place from which to trump everyone who was anyone. DC's hottest designer, who'd categorically excluded Jill's garage sale finds, decorated Elmore's soulless triumph. After a battle, Jill had angrily stored her own things at the Halcyon House, their family home. Had all that, to Jill's concern about their five-year-old Stevie, whom everyone thought was more than just child childishly dotty, particularly when he'd been begun insisting that his name was not Stevie, but Wens. Jill finished her third cigarette and the gnats fled. The budding greenness of the forest enveloped her. She turned down a little used path lined by starry spring wildflowers, and two kids in a rowboat struggled with oars far, far out on the lake. Megan dumped her bags, sat on the rock next to the water, and stretched her legs out in front of her. She and Brian and Jill should really do something about the old house downtown. It would free up a lot of money. Their parents had left a mysterious trust, held by a secret trustee that even Elmore, who considered himself a legal wizard, could not track down. The taxes were paid on time, checks were sent to Jill, the oldest for bare bones maintenance, and all three children got a small monthly stipend. Since neither parent had been declared dead, Megan knew that Elmore frequently raged that various time limits were up and they needed to sell the property and divide up the money, but none of the dance kids wanted that. Elmore's latest feint was to attack the very legality of the trust, but since no papers were available, he was having a difficult time doing so. The property had not been in the best location when their parents bought it, but now it was worth a bundle, 
and their tax bill reflected this. Halcyon House, bordered by a park much like this one, was bound on one side by a strong, fresh-running stream. Let's try to find another house like that downtown. But the old mansion had fanciful turrets and odd roof junctures that made leaks hard to climb and was monstrously huge. Elmore thought it a wasteful hobby that the sentimental dance brood needed to cash in on. The emotional turmoil Elmore seemed bent on maintaining might have something to do with Stevie giving himself a new name, Wens. A new identity called Anyone But Me. Elmore's wearing bid for partnership, which seemed to have permanently warped his once easygoing personality, might last for years. Jill had jumped hand in hand with Elmore into the maelstrom, so it wasn't as if she had known what might happen. But maybe Jill's deepest problem was that she missed her father. Megan did too, fiercely. Megan, Brian, and Jill had gone to Germany, his last known destination, but they had not found him. Jill's screaming fit a month into the search convinced Megan and Brian that it was time to quit. Brian had hired a private detective who showed up one day at Brian's house looking frightened and returned the retainer. He refused to say why, just cited family problems that kept him from traveling. So now they were left with this double hole in their family, the vanished parents. Dad had not gone to look for Mom in 1963, even though her body was never found. He had held no funeral. It seemed very strange to Megan now that she was grown. You'd think he would have done both, but he did show them the letter from the State Department that said Betty Elegante Dance was missing, presumed dead. Megan had been too young to question Dad, as she should have during those years before he, too, had left, or died somewhere undocumented, maybe even under a different name. Megan was now positive that her dad had known all along that Betty was still alive and was furious that he had withheld that information. Obviously, the dance lines of communication were not as clear as they ought to have been. Megan was sure that Jill knew something she was not talking about, something about why both parents were gone. But if so, why not tell her and Brian? Megan stood, rehoisted her bags, and headed out of the woods. She passed through an empty ball field and emerged from the woods many blocks from home if the meandering streets of Tall Oaks could be said to contain blocks. Regaining the sidewalk, she continued to muse, admiring the gardens of her neighbors in spite of her worry. Crocuses, yellow forsythia, lovely front porch with those wicker chairs. Jill always enjoyed this walk, exclaimed about everything she saw, along with Wens. Stevie, Megan told herself firmly. Megan su suspected that Jill's hardcore medications were the result of Elmore's fears, which he no doubt communicated strongly to the doctor. These were drugs for schizophrenia, and perhaps from Elmore's point of view, that was Jill. Schizophrenic, seeing things, hearing voices, needing to be controlled. Megan walked faster. Her role was suddenly clear. She would have to meet the doctor, have a talk with him. Jill probably didn't need drugs at all, not her Jill. She needed something, but not drugs. Megan knew a lot about pharmacology, not that MDs were inclined to listen to anyone else. She'd give them all a talking to, raise hell. As she walked, she got more and more fired up. She called Jim and asked him to pick her up at the corner. Take Abby to Beth's. I know. Tell her I love her and I want to see her, but I think we need to get over to the hospital. So that's the end of the chapter about Megan's reaction to her sister being suddenly incarcerated in St. Elizabeth's, uh, just outside of in, inside of Washington, D.C. She had a breakdown while riding her bike back from her, uh, her last class in her acquisition of her doctorate at Georgetown. And she had gotten her uh, time frames mixed up. And her professor called her on that. He said, you seem to remember reality in which Kennedy died. What's that all about? And she said, uh, I don't know. I'm, uh, I used to write comic books when I was in high school. And he, he looked at her and he said, hmm? She said, oh no, oh no. So 
So while she was riding her bike home, she got more and more confused and, and went off track and ended up at her family home, uh, which was pretty much abandoned but maintained by a trust and uh, broke her way into the uh, living room and uh, presumably someone called an ambulance, ambulance and she had ended up at St. Elizabeth's. So that's why her sister had this reaction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's about. Thank you. Thank you.